hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, herkese merhaba. Good morning to those joining from North America and good evening to colleagues in Turkey, Turkey and and also Europe. Uh, in addition, herkese iyi bayramlar. I just realized that this uh, talk is on the last day of Ramadan. Um, my um so enjoy enjoy the bayram and um my name is Özgür Yılmaz I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia and I'm also the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences I'm very excited and honored uh to introduce our speaker today my colleague and my mentor um Professor Nasip Kusup of UBC um Professor Gusup has obtained his PhD uh, in 1970, uh, in fact, Dr. Adeta uh, in 1979 from Université Pierre Marie Curie. Uh, shortly after, he joined UBC. His research interests are in nonlinear analysis, PDE, and optimal transport theory. Uh, he has a remarkable record of deep, original, and influential contributions uh, to the theory and applications of functional analysis, calculus of variations, PDE, and optimal transport. Uh, his, his pioneering work on the resolution of the, the Georgi conjecture on the PDE of microelectromechanical systems and on the theory of self dual PDE have all had a lasting impact on, on mathematical analysis. In addition to these, he made extraordinary contributions to the mathematical sciences community in Western Canada, all of Canada and, and beyond. He is the founding director of uh, two big Canadian uh, mathematical sciences institutes, but the, one of them is PIMS, uh, the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences. I'm extremely honored to, 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 to lead PIMS right now. The other one is the Banff International Research Station, BERS. Uh, both of these institutes, he's the founding director. Um, he's also a co-founder of MITAX. He's a fellow, fellow of AMS, CMS, Canadian Mathematical Society, Fields Institute. He received uh, the Coltsetter James Price, Jeffrey Williams Prize, and David Borwine Distinguished Career Award from the Canadian Mathematical Society. In 2019, uh, he was awarded the CRM Fields PIMS Prize uh, by the three Canadian math, 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 Mathematical Sciences Institutes. He was elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1993 and was appointed officer of the Order of Canada in December 2015. I could talk way more, but maybe I shouldn't. So at this point, let me hand it to Nassif. Uh, he will talk uh, about mass transport counter which operators and their ergodic properties. Thank you, Osgur, uh, for this kind introduction. Um, and um, well, first, it's an honor for me to talk to uh, to you guys. Uh, I wish I could have been there physically and not uh, on Zoom, but soon, I hope. Uh, I'll come and visit. And I'm sorry for those of you who are uh, fasting in the last day of uh, Ramadan. It's really unfortunate that you have to be listening to this talk on that uh, such a day. Um, so my my talk is a bit unusual. It's not like a, a problem solved or a, or breakthrough or anything. It's just, it is really about a new, I'm trying to sell you a new notion that many of you may have used already, but I mean, I would just to, uh, to, I want to formalize it because it really leads to many, many, um, uh, many open questions, interesting problems. And the notion is of Kantorovich operators. And the, the notion extends the notion of Markov operators. And all of you analysts have dealt with Markov operators. So if you're a ergodic theorist, you dealt with um, Bernoulli shifts and, and point transformation and their iterates. Uh, in 
probability theory, you dealt with transition probabilities, which are Markov operators. If you are in uh, potential theory, you dealt with uh, kernel operators and Poisson kernels, etc. So they're all over the place in classical analysis. And um, the control which operator are an extension of Markov operators. They are nonlinear extensions, but as I will show you that they are really the first attempt to extend what we know about Markov operators to nonlinear operators. Uh, this is the smallest class which is manageable of nonlinear operators, but they are ubiquitous, they are all over the place. Um, and um, that's what I want to show you why first. Uh, so now, how do I? How do I do this? Okay. So I will I will start by um, by motivating uh, why I got this uh, idea, and I'm not gonna go through this uh, outline because you will forget about it before I get to it. And here, okay. So. The initial motivation comes from the theory of mass transport. The theory of mass transport is the following. You have a cost function, the cost of moving a particle in X to a particle in Y. Uh, an engineer of Napoleon, Monge, uh, he's the one who really defined the problem. He wanted to move some dirt optimally from one place to another. You, know, you have a distribution mu of dirt and then uh, distribution u of a place where a uh, hole where he wants to put it. And then <clears throat> the cost of moving x to y is c of x, y. And then all the potential ways of moving this dirt is, is, is given by a, a map t, point transformation. And when you say that t pushes mu into nu, that means that whatever it's written here for every measurable set, the mu of a is mu of the, it's essentially uh, it's a change of variable. So you take all the the cost of moving x c, uh, to tx, c of x tx, and then you take the total uh, mass, move moving the mass, which is the integral d mu, and you minimize over all possible ways of pushing mu into nu. This is a Initial problem. And for Monge, uh, the cost was just uh, the Euclidean distance between x and tx, the cost. Okay, so that means cost is proportional to the distance. So it's, um, and the question is that is this, at, is there a, a map that's at, where it's attained? Um, can you, is it map, uh, map regular? Can you, um, um, can you characterize this map in any way? Okay, this this problem is like two hundred fifty years old, and um, one major um, advance came from Kontorovich uh, in, uh, in Saint Petersburg, nineteen forty two, when he was surrounded by uh, the Nazis in Saint Petersburg, and he developed this duality that essentially this infimum. Uh, over the cost, total cost, is uh, supremum over a decoupling of the cost C. So you take all the, C is a function of X and Y, but if you take all possible functions of Y and X, Psi and Phi, well, such that the difference is bounded above by C, and then you take the supremum over um, the integral of psi d nu, the, the marginals nu and nu. <clears throat> mu and nu are, are given. Then this infimum is equal to the supremum. It's like an uh, f max uh, situation. This was uh, a duality of uh, Monge, of, of uh, Kantorovich. 
And of course, in fact, the existence of psi and phi says so that this is verified really tells you what's, uh, can give you an idea about the map um, that solved the problem. But my interest here is different. My interest is, is the following. So you have this supreme of all possible psi and phi. But then if psi is given, you can find an optimal phi for which this inequality holds. If psi is given, the optimal phi for which this inequality holds, you can just write it down as t, mi t minus psi, and I'll tell you why it's t minus, is the supremum of psi minus the cost over y. And vice versa also, if you fix phi, for each phi, there exists an optimal psi for which this inequality holds, and it's given by this inf and blue t plus of phi. So really, instead of taking all possible phi's and psi's, you can you can say you take take all the possible psi's or all the possible phi's, and and the other one is given by this formula, the optimal uh, function in the pair. So this gives you operators. I call them t minus and t plus. Okay. So now the duality is very clear. The infimum is equal to the supremum of, of this, these quantities. Okay, the integral of psi d nu minus integral of t minus psi d mu. Okay. So these are typical Kontorovich operators for me. Um, you see they're nonlinear. Okay, the definitions in the and you see why I call them backward and forward because there are two two kinds. Uh, okay, one is goes from C of y. By the by the way, uh, C of y are space of continuous functions of y on y, and C of x. So I assume x and y are compact spaces, and so that you can simplify. Uh, or suppose it's your Euclidean space. Okay, x and y are just R D. And uh, so C of Y, C of X are continuous functions. And then P of X, P of Y are probability measures on X and Y. So, so as you see, this is a typical uh, controversial operators. And I want to uh, tell you that this is just one sample of many. Now, I promise you an ergodic theory. I want to iterate these operators. Why? Here's another motivation that comes from uh, the calculus of variation, actually the Hamiltonian systems. So you take a Lagrangian on, on a Riemannian uh, manifold and L, and uh, you consider this cost of moving X to Y by uh, using this uh, basic um, cost of the uh, Calculus of variation, uh, least action. Among all paths joining x and y, you take the infimum of the integral between zero and t. T is a fixed time of um, Lagrangian of the velocity and the position. Okay, so this uh, you know L is some nice Lagrangian. I'm not going to put the, the conditions here. Now the optimal curve, as you know, satisfies the other Lagrange equation, which is. Uh, this. this is very standard. Another standard thing is that you assume uh, the Lagrangian convex in the velocity. And then, uh, because it's convex, you can define its Legendre transform, H. And the Legendre transform is a Hamiltonian associated to the Lagrangian. So once you have this, then instead of dealing with the Lagrangian equation, which is a second order equation, you can transform it into a first order uh, equation, which is really a Hamiltonian system. Okay, so to find the optimal path, you solve this Hamiltonian system uh, X and P, um, okay, where P is a co state of X is a position, P is a co state given by the derivative in the, of L in the, in the V direction. So this is classical. 
And you'd like to know uh, whether there exist uh, Hamiltonian orbits, for example, uh, uh, periodic orbits, in, in case you are in a uh, periodic case. So to solve this, you want to use a change of variable. And uh, the change of variable, um, here I didn't realize I'm going a bit, a bit slowly. So it, does, it doesn't matter. I will, I will not finish all the slides, but as long as, as you get the, <laughs> the idea. Uh, so a change of variable is essentially you would like to change the Hamiltonian system to another Hamiltonian system, which is much easier to, to solve, okay? But to change the Hamiltonian system to another one, you need a canonical transformation, okay? That means the transformation phi, change of variable, which changes the Hamiltonian H into Hamiltonian K. Okay, so that, okay, but you'd like the Hamiltonian K, the new one, to have trivial dynamics, to be very simple to, to, to solve. So, um, can, can you see my, my uh, thing here? Yeah. So, you'd like to solve, uh, if you change uh, H to K, Right, and then this would be the Hamiltonian system, and you see it just in the simple ODE, and it can be uh, solved. Okay, okay. Now the question is that how are you going to find this uh, canonical transformation? Uh, you say, okay, one way to do it is really to uh, find a generating function. So I mean, a solution uh, to this. Uh, so, a generating function is a function that satisfies this. Uh, and to find this generating function, okay, one way to do it is really to solve this equation. It's it's a, it's just uh, h is the Hamiltonian, and then h bar is is a constant that will eventually uh, come from this. So this is one way to find the canonical transformation, um, okay, which is integrable, if you can, to solve this thing. Now, can Kolmogorov, uh, Arnold Moser is really the theory that says, yes, if you start with integral, an integrable Hamiltonian is the one where you can find such a, such a transformation. So, a very elaborate theory of uh, uh, CAM, Kolmogorov and Moser is that yes, you can do it for small perturbations. Of if you start with integral the Hamiltonian, you can perturb it a little bit, then you can still find it. More recently, there's something called weak CAM theory, which is okay. Remember, we want to find a solution for the stationary aspect of this. So you say, okay, let's consider the dynamic aspect of this, which is the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Now for this, we know how to find solutions, even though it's uh, maybe singular or stuff like that, we can find solutions using the uh, this operation, a lax organic semi-group, okay? So if you have F, you want to start F, with F, and you want to solve here, the solution can be given by T, for at time T by this uh, emphemum, okay? So this is well known that this is a solution of the stationary, of the dynamic hamilton jacobi equation, okay? But you, would, you don't want to solve the dynamic, you want to solve the stationary one, which is much harder. And to do that, you take this and you would like a weak camp solution, it means you would like to find a, a solution to this equation, TTU plus constant, plus some constant T equal U. Okay, so this is, if you find uh, U like this, then you're done. Because if you formally differentiate, U is, uh, um, is independent of time, if you formally differentiate, then this is just derivative of this equal, equal to C uh, and 
and you get you get a solution of the uh, stationary Hamilton equation. Okay, so it's easy to find the one for the dynamic, but then you want to solve this. But this is what is this? TT is a semi-group. It's almost like you iterated one operator, and you manage you manage to find a a um, a solution for the iterate here, TTU plus CT is equal to U. See, if C was equal to zero, this is, you know, it means you're trying to find an invariant function of the semigroup T. But here, C is not equal to zero, and TT are not Markov processes, are not Markov operators. But again, I'll, TT is a typical Kantorovich operator. So you would like to find a fixed point in a way up to a constant for these Kantorovich operators. Okay, that's why I'm motivating why you need the iterates. Um, you need to study the iterates of a Kantorovich operator. So, formal definition: you know, Markov operators are operators from continuous function to continuous function. They are positive. That means they are map. They are monotone. Um, Increasing monotone, right? If f bigger than g is, it? they are linear, Markovian. T one is equal to one, and then they are continuous. This is a, really the standard uh, Markov operator. Now, what is the formal definition of a Kontorovich operator? Kontorovich. So, as already I showed you, that this is a backward definition of forward. The backward goes from continuous function to upper semi-continuous function in X. So you're going from Y to X, okay? And they verify the following. Monotone increasing, which is an analog of this. And then affine on the constants only. That means if C is a constant and G is a function, then it's, it's affine. So it's, not, it's linear only along the constant functions, okay? Convex, which is a weakening of the linearity, okay? And then lower semi-continuous, which is a weakening of the continuity. Okay, so that's a, these are the four axioms that, um, that ex extend Markov operators. But these are linear, these are non-linear, but you see they have lots of nice features. Now, the forward Kontorovich operator, now it's what is, it's now the opposite. You go from continuous function on X to lower semi-continuous functions, fine. It verifies one and two, it's the same. For three, it's a concave. And for four, it's upper semi-continuous. So I, I will focus only on the backward Kontorovich operators. And uh, now these things are all over the place. All, any one of you who did standard potential theory, probability theory, or ergodic theory dealt with this in, a, in an implicit way. Why? For example, suppose you start with T Markov, which is linear, but then you take this new operator, which is a supremum. You lost linearity, okay? Supremum between G and TG, you lost linearity. But this is a Kontorovich operator. This is the most trivial one, okay? But then this operator you've seen all over the place in potential theory, because if you iterate this operator, it increases to another operator, which is also Kontorovich, and the limiting operator is the least T superharmonic function above G. This is, this is how you find the law, at least, this is an abstract version of finding the smallest T sub, uh, superharmonic function above the function G. Another operator is the filling scheme in, uh, in ergodic theory, okay? You t, t is Markov, and then you consider this operator, TG plus minus G minus, and you iterate, this is the filling scheme. This is well known to prove the chacon ornstein theorem for uh, in ergodic theory or, or uh, to prove um, uh, embeddings of measure into, into Brownian motions and 
so it's 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 very very important operator. But there you see it's a nonlinear operator, uh, and but it's Kantorovich operator. Another oper uh, operator that, that you might know very well. You take you take a function g and you would like to define a purely subharmonic, purely superharmonic envelope. So you take uh, delta. Delta bar here is a two two dimensional disk. Okay, so two dimensional uh, disk, and. And, and you take this operator, you take in any direction v, you take the disk centered at x and then around uh, and the direction of v, okay, in your, in your open set. And then you average because I mean, you're trying to find a, a subharmonic function which is in every two dimensional um, subspace. This is a purely subharmonic function, okay. So you take the supremum over all possible uh, two-dimensional disk. This is also a a Kantorovich operator. Okay, it's implicit. It's used in harmonic analysis, but it's a Kantorovich operator. And then when you iterate it, you get this. This time you have p polynomial here as opposed to just uh, uh, this linear thing. And this is also a Kantorovich operator. You uh, u minus is one, and then it iterates. Okay, is one, and it gives you the truly superharmonic envelope of G. Okay, the smallest truly superharmonic function above G. Same thing with um, harmonic function, but this time you take the not two dimensional disk. You take the balls. Okay. You take all the balls centered at x and the radius r, okay? And then you average, and you take the supreme of all possible r as long as you are in the open set O. This is a superharmonic function. I um, mean, uh, this is a uh, Kondrovich operator. And when you iterate it again and again, you end up with <clears throat> the superharmonic envelope that you can um right in terms of uh, Brian motion and stopping times. So all these are very standard um, notions in, in harmonic analysis, potential theory, algorithmic theory, etc. And all of them involve nonlinear operators that you uh, people uh, used. But all these are one homogeneous. Okay, U of lambda f is lambda U of f for all lambda positive. Okay, all these operators I show you are classical and then the homogeneous. Can you characterize them? So, okay, also, I mean, there's a notion in probability, which is a notion of a gambling house. A gambling house is a subset of x cross probability on y. And a gambling house allows you that for each x, if you have a um, wells, if you, if you are at X with uh, wells X, then you can choose sigma, which is a distribution of gains. Okay? You're allowed. So for each X, you'll allow the sigma. As long as X sigma belongs to S, that means you are in the house. Okay? So a gambling house is a subset, roughly, um, of X cross P of I, says that the marginal is... Oil. There's the projection is all of x, so it means that means for every x, this is non empty. You have a choice, okay, to, to select a gain distribution. But once you have this and you have any reward function g, then you can maximize over all possible choices sigma. So if you are at Wells x, okay, and you can choose a sigma, you can maximize your reward function over all your possible choices on the gambling house. That's a classical. A theory of Dubin, Savage, de la Mayer. It was developed in the seventies, and okay, but it's a typical one homogeneous operator, also Kantorovich operator, not linear Kantorovich, but also it's one homogeneous, right? Lambda g here, lambda goes out. 
But then you can also define a regulated gambling house. Regulated gambling house is that, you know, you cannot just chain, uh, choose sigma at random, right? Uh, you have to, uh, the game has to be fair. So for example, if uh, Delta X and U are in convex order, that means uh, for any convex function, phi of X is less than integral phi D nu, this is a convex order. In other words, X is the very center of nu. So it's a martingale, right? So when you move from X to nu, you have to, it has to be a fair game. Can that be a, okay. So this is a regulated gambling house by a cone A. This time here is a cone of convex functions on A. Okay. So this is a, this is a typical gambling house. Okay, so um, it's a it's a particular case of a one homogeneous controversial operator, but it, but then it turned out that it uh, it characterizes all one homogeneous controversial operators. Okay, there's there's always a kind of gambling house regulated by a closed convex ballet cone on the disjoint union such that you have this. Okay, so. All the operators from classical analysis, probability, regular theory, potential theory, are essentially um, one homogeneous, and they can be categorized as um, as uh, using a gambling house and a balayage. A balayage that means when you have a cone. A balayage with respect to a cone A is when a, a mu is below new for that balayage is if you have this property. So if, if phi is a cone of convex function, that means um, mu is diffused into new, right? This is a typical uh, sweeping out theory and, and potential theory when, uh, when you push a measure toward the boundary, okay? So you push them in with a convex order. So this is a, this if a is a convex, the cone of convex function, but actually here, the, here it's a general. You can always find a cone A, which is general uh, in, in general. Okay, and then uh, you can it and if you iterate this, you get you get another controversial operator, and then you get the, the reduit operator with respect to this cone. So, okay. so that's one homogeneous case. Now. What about non-homogeneous controversial operators? For example, in ergodic theory, ergodic theory, you take a point transformation and you take the operator G composed with sigma. So suppose A of X is zero. That's a point transformation. It's Markov, it's linear. You study its iterates, right? And then you, this is really the heart of ergodic theory. But now suppose you add a potential A here, just fix potential A. So this operator is not uh, linear anymore. Okay, it's, it's you know very close to linear. It's almost a, it's a fine, but uh, uh, but it's not linear. So when you iterate, you get something else, and this is what's called ergodic optimization of symbolic dynamics. So when you iterate this, you would like to eventually, to this will uh, get you to minimize this potential, the integral of this potential among all sigma invariant measures mu. So uh, you, uh, this iteration leads you to sigma invariant measures that minimize this, this potential. So it's really, it's the first nonlinear extension of regular ergodic theory, okay? When you, when you have to uh, minimize a certain potential. Now, this is a typical Kantorovich operator that you also would like to iterate and see the, its behavior. Okay, that's the one that I started with, optimal mass transport. Also is Kontorovich, but they are not one homogeneous. Okay, 
So a typical case is that if the cost function is the scalar product between X and Y, then the backward uh, controversial operator is minus the Legendre transform, and the forward is the Legendre transform of minus. So this is in the Brunier uh, transport. So again, these are not one homogeneous. Okay, so what happened? What's what's new? Entropic if you if you start with mass transport with cost C, and then you use entropic regularization, which is very fashionable these days, then you get new operators. These are the new operators, and these are nonlinear, but they are also Kantorovich operators. And if you iterate this, this is really the well-known synchron algorithm. So they are all over the place. But now these we are in the category of non-homogeneous. So calculus of variation, you take you have a Lagrangian L, you define this operator. Okay. And which means that for oper this oper uh, for state, if if you uh, if um, if you are at time one in G, okay, then this operator gives you the solution at time zero, okay, of this Hamilton Jacobi equation. So it's a backward Hamilton Jacobi equation, a solution of Hamilton Jacobi equation, right? If you if you are at time one on G, then at time zero it's given by this operator. So this is a typical backward uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation. And um, uh, but this is also um, not control bridge. But then also you can do the stochastic control. And instead of uh, taking L x dot, here you can put a drift and you minimize you, you maximize over solutions of all uh, possible uh, solution of this uh, stochastic equation where beta is a drift over all possible beta, and here this is Brian in motion. So you can do this, and this time you get a backward Hamilton uh, uh, Jacobi equation, but second order. That means now you have the Laplacian. And now this time you can only solve it backward. Okay, so you only have a backward control of operator, but you don't have a forward. In the deterministic case, you had a backward and a forward because you can start at G or you can end at G to get the other piece. Here, it's only one-sided control bridge operator. So these are examples. I'm giving you examples to tell you that they are all over the place. Now, how do you characterize them? Well, it turned out if, if this, they're not one homogeneous, then there is a gambling house regulated by cone A, but the new factor here is there is a cost. There's a cost, C. So if you are at X, what's X, and you're choosing a distribution of gain sigma, you are paying for it. If you choose sigma, you have to pay cos c of x sigma c of x sigma. So it's really a gambling house that charges fees. Okay. So this is really the difference between a general control of each operator and the and the and the, the one homogeneous control of operators that you've seen in classical analysis, potential theory, and and ergodic theory. In a way, you can call this as free potential theory, free probability, and free uh, ergodic theory. Free probability is taken, uh, unfortunately, by the non commutative people. Well, now you can deal with operations that really have a cost, that charge you something. So this is really a characterization of backward uh, of um, it's a gambling house with a cost. Okay, it turned out that these are 
when you want to iterate, you would like to, you know, take the T of the limit, the limit of T's, right? You would like to always exchange the, the limits with the operator. So you'd like to know what happens. It turns out that these are Choquet capacities. Choquet capacity is usually a set function that's monotone. It goes up on all the sets, but it goes down well on compact sets. This is a capacity. Then Choquet eventually decided that, uh, I mean, it wrote as note is that actually functional capacities are, are uh, as important, where you have now an operator between all the positive functions to, uh, and then monotone go down on the upper semi-continuous functions, go up on any function. These are functional capacities. So the relationship is that if you if t is a function uh, capacity, then for each x it gives you a regular capacity. Yeah, this for each x this definition gives you a regular Schrödinger capacity. So it's amazing is that you can extend a control which operator to all functions via this. Um, formula which is an outer integral because now because now you know you have a characterization of it right in terms of a cost once you have this cost then you can extend it like this and then you can extend to the map from upper semi-continuous to upper semi-continuous now why is this important because you want to iterate first you're starting from continuous to upper semi-continuous but then if you want to apply it again you're not allowed to apply it to upper semi-continuous function, right? You can, you, can, you can apply it only to continuous functions. So to iterate, you have to extend this map. So you extend this map, you can, you can extend it to be, uh, okay, as a showcase capacity. Um, and this allows you to do lots of things. For example, you can now talk about the nonlinear uh, potential theory. Uh, remember, if you minimize uh, Dirichlet and, uh, the energy, if G is a set over all possible U bigger than the characteristic function of the set, then it's a usual Newtonian capacity, right? But here, you can add now a cost function. Okay, if you add the cost function C, and then you minimize, then this is a Kontorovich uh, operator. Same thing with dynamic programming principles um, for variational uh, solution. So again, all these are examples as coming from various parts of analysis. But what is the secret? The secret is there's a duality between Kontorovich operator and essentially mass transport in general. So take, suppose I have, we have a function on, on the probability measures on X times probability measure on Y. Convex function, in other words, for each couple of probability distribution, mu and u, you assign a number. It's a correlation between two probability measures. Correlation to, to a probability measure are everywhere in analysis and statistics, right? You just want to measure the distance between the probability measure and another one, regardless of what you're doing. So suppose you have such a one, which is convex and uh, et cetera. And then you take the partial maps. I mean, if you fix the initial measure, you take it as a function of the final measure new or vice versa if you fix the final measure new you take it as a function these are the partial maps <clears throat> there are convex functions on measures you take a legend transform because they are convex functions these are functions on, on on continuous functions now suppose you have this relationship so the legend transform of tau mu, I am, again, tau mu is when you fixed mu and you vary the, the last uh, variable. Take the Legendre transform. 
If it's of this form, then we call it a linear transfer. A linear transfer. So what what does it what does this formula mean? It means that mu to the Legendre transform of time mu is linear, right? So for each initial function mu, the t mu star is given by an operation like this. So if you you call this tau, this correlation with your measures, a backward linear transfer if this is true. By the Legendre transform, in other words, you have this duality formula. But this is exactly the Kantorovich duality formula. Okay? But this time, T minus is a more complicated object. It's not what I've written in the first slide. Okay? T minus is just any Kantorovich operator. For forward, it's the same thing. You have a T uh, this you can write. So these are correlations between measures, which verify a Kantorovich type formula, duality formula, with T minus and T plus are as general Kantorovich operators. They are not just a regular uh, mass transport. Okay, they are you know major extension of mass transport. Okay. But as you see, it contains much more than mass regular mass transport. So, but the duality is between such transfers and, and, and such operators. In Markov theory, okay, you have an operator uh, acts on uh, functions, the adjoint acts on measures. Here, the same thing. The operator, Kontorovich, not acts on functions, but the dual is really is uh, the linear transfers between measures. But again, all of this is nonlinear, but the duality is perfect. Uh, not only that, the these transfers can be given as a mass transport. But this time, the cost function is, doesn't map x into a point y. It maps x into a distribution pi x. OK? So you take all the possible probability measures whose distribution whose marginals are mu and u. You disintegrate along mu you get an x pi x disintegration. And if you minimize over all possible transport plan this time, this is called optimal weak transport. This was introduced formally by Goslan, a company in France, but actually it originated in work of Telegram. Now that Telegram has won the Abel Prize, we have to really I refer to him. The work of Telegram is really his the first time uh, people use. Um, I mean, he, he introduced mass transport, but but uh, but of this kind that you know you don't have cost of moving x to y, but really moving x to it, probably a distribution to prove his concentration inequalities and and uh, all the deep stuff that he did. So um, it originates in the in the work of Telegram. Uh, to the, to to um, to define this optimal weak transport, which are formalized by uh, Guzlan and uh, AI. So it turns out that these transfers can be characterized as such. Okay, so this descent, if the disintegration is like this, where where x is the very center of pi x, if you will. Uh, or if you have this order with respect to some balayage cone, then uh, I call this optimal balayage transport. Okay, so this is a, a vast extension of of optimal transport, where here you don't have c of x y. 
that you have a measure, but also the measures, the disintegration of the measures have to have to respect certain order. Okay, so it's, it's called Valier transport. If the order is a convex order, then it's up to a martingale transport. So it turned out to that the duality is perfect between Kontorovich operators, backward linear transfer, and this linear transfer are nothing else but optimal balayage transport. Okay, so this tra uh, transfer, these transfers can be written as a. Uh, Okay, so I, I think I'm okay. So this is a duality. Now you want to iterate them and you want to use the per duality. So if you want to iterate Kantorovich operator like this, so what happened to the dual, which are the transfers? So the iteration here corresponds to convolution. Okay, so if you have a bunch of transfers, so to go from u to u is uh, we take all the possible way t1 to go mu to sigma 1, sigma 1 to sigma 2, etc. until you get to n. You can take all the possible ways to get from u to u and you minimize. This gives you a convolution of the transfers. And this corresponds, dually, this corresponds to this iteration. So this is very similar. Then now you can, you can iterate, you can use the duality. Okay, here I'm gonna just, uh, I, uh, my time is really, um, you can define, a, a, you remember there's always a constant, right? Uh, you can define the matter constant, which is a fear. If, um, this is it's like a self, you know, it's uh, you this time X and Y are the same. So you'd like to see how, um, Okay, in other words, it's a minimization on the diagonal. Okay, tau is a tra transfer from mu to mu, and you would like to minimize the self transfer, if you will, of measures from you using tau. So it gives you a constant. If the, co the constant is at, uh, attained by mu, by called minimal measures, all, all these come from Mather theory in, in Hamiltonian. The terminology comes from Mather theory. Now, we are looking for fixed points. So a backward solution, a sub-solution, is if you have this at level k. k is a constant. OK? And the solution is you have this. So you're looking for, if t is a Kontorovich operator, you're looking for a function g and a constant k such that this is true. So this is really the, the, the aim. This is a. Um, weak cam solutions in case T is uh, comes from the uh, Lagrangian dynamics. The Manet constant is supreme or of such case. So and then you can you can prove uh, things that uh, tau, tau n is really the iterate of the transfer. So you can have a formula for this constant C, the, the matter constant. You can prove formulas like the Cesaro averages like this. Okay. And and you can prove if tau is bounded above, you can prove. So the, the so there is a privilege constant that appears. I call it the matter constant. And it just happens that it is the only constant where you can have solutions, weak cam solutions, okay? If you have this, then K has to be C of T. And the general theorem that you can say for any counterovich operators is either you have a weak cam sub-solution or, or you have this, or oh, things blow up for every G, for every G, and this is a possibility, right? For that these things blow, the iterates blow up for every G. So this is the only general theorem that you can uh, that you can have, but now you have to add some some conditions. But let's say let's let's be more ambitious. Okay, so we start with an operator, but now 
not only we want to have one solution, but we would like for every G to, to find a way from it to construct a solution, a weak time solution. Okay, so this is a, this is a solution. This is a weak time uh, weak time solution, right? For t, so t infinity is one way. Starting with any g, you would like to find a weak time solution. Okay, so you see this is a limiting procedure for t, and t infinity has to be idempotent. It means the square is equal to itself, and then you should have this. So T infinity will map any G to a backward weak cam solution. So suppose that we um, we can find this. So we'd like for any of control operator, we'd like to find a what I call a weak cam operator. Okay, which is that mean it it, it it finds solutions for you. And then you have a limiting um Linear transfer, we call it peace barrier again, uh, coming from Hamiltonian system terminology. So we have cases where we can do this. So um, I mean, I mean uh, you know, each one of them is a different theorem. When we can find such a control which operators, I'm not gonna. Okay, and and then so what? So what, what do you do? So you start with any control which operator, then we can find a weak cam operator. And then this will be the um, properties of the weak cam operator associated to it. Uh, instead of uh, just having one operator and it's iterate, you can have a semi-group of operators, which is really where, uh, so instead of iterating one operator, you, have, you already have the semi-group and you're looking what happened when t goes to infinity. So, but, all this is true in the case of um, Hamiltonian system. Okay, so you 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 recover all the theorems in the case of Hamiltonian system, but what's the key here is that there is a, a number of matter. This is called matter theory, right? Whatever I showed you very very early on, but the but but this correspond to one very specific semi group of Kantorovich operators. But now you can have many um, cam, weak cam theories. Not, for example, you can have one associated with stochastic. Um, stochastic, uh, you can develop a stochastic fatty matter theory, okay? Because now it is, this is, is also a control which operator. And then, and then you can do symbolic dynamics also you can develop a matter theory for symbolic dynamics. So there is a matter theory for any semi-group of Kantorovich operator. And there are many, many of them uh, around. So this is really what I would like to leave you leave you with. I'm sorry I, I couldn't detail the end, but I just want to give you an idea is that once you formalize really what's needed, then matter theory, which is a deep theory in the, in the in, Hamiltonian dynamics can be um, developed in many other situations and not just in regular um, uh, uh, symplectic geometry or, or Hamiltonian dynamics. Sorry, this is it. Thanks. Thank you, Nassif. Um, a wonderful talk, uh, lots of material to digest. Um, I wanted to ask if there are any questions. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. Okay, um, well, if there are no other questions, I, again, let's thank Nasib one more time. Uh, and um, 
I'll just um, maybe stop recording and and happy to hang out for a few minutes if if you would like to to chat if Nasif has time, of course, and um, 